get ready. We're going to go through principles of financial fulfillment. If you've been with me for 12 months, I'm repeating some things here, but they're worth repeating. These are some of my core beliefs about money and life in general. The number one principle to financial fulfillment, spend money in a way that aligns with your values. Spend money in a way that aligns with your values. I've taught that for 25 years. What has been different about the way I have always taught money is that I believe it's values first and money second. When you are clear on what is most important to you, what are your values? And today I would now, if I were rewriting my books, I would say, and what are your principles? When you make financial decisions based on your values, based on your principles, your financial decisions will be easier. When you look at all the things in your life where you've gotten either stuck financially, you, you know there's all these things you should do. I gave you so much homework last year, like do this, do this, do this. And many of you have done it because I've gotten your emails and you've shared with me the work you've done. And some of you might've started it, then you stop. This happens all the time when we start to grow. We grow and we stop, and we grow and we stop. If you're clear on your values, why you're doing this work, you will follow through. Even if you get off track, you'll come back and you'll restart. If you're not clear on your values, it becomes very abstract. Like one of the things I always see financial experts talk about is the numbers of, of how you need to save a million dollars for retirement. You need to save $2 million for retirement. I've revealed you need $5 million for retirement. You need $10 million for retirement. The other day I watched somebody say, you need to have 25 times your annual income saved for retirement or you can't retire. And if you're 70 and you have 25 times your money, you can't retire. What? Like such generic bad advice. Because there will be over 10,000 of you that will watch this. Each and every one of you has different values, different drives, different fears, and how much money and different lifestyles. And you live in different areas and your expenses are different and your health is different. And all of that gets factored into how much money do you need? But I can tell you this, when you, sh you show me somebody who's, who's spending money in a way that conflicts with their values, I will show you somebody who will struggle financially for the rest of their life. If you show me somebody who is, is spending money or investing money in a way that conflicts with their values, and I will show you somebody who doesn't have fulfillment. The fastest way to have fulfillment is to use the money that you work so hard to make to save it and invest in a way that helps you reach what's most important to you, your values and your principles. And that, my friends, I could stop right there. <laughs> because what I've truly what I've just said to you is incredibly deep. And you could just now spend an hour and really take that in and think about it. I'm not going to have you do that because I've got more content to share with you today. But it's so deep. A good financial planner should be asking you about your values, should be talking to you about your family's principles. And the thing about values and principles is they change and they evolve. What's most important to you is going to be different at 60 than it was at 50. It's different at 50 than it will be than it was at 40. As we get older, as our lives change, as our health changes, as the people around us change, not only do our goals change, but sometimes our values change. So these are very important, deep, not woo-woo things to talk about. They're really meaningful. So that's number one. Spend money in a way that aligns with your values. All right. Number two, pay yourself first. All right, my friends, you've heard me talk about this repeatedly over the year. If you've read my books, see me on the Oprah shows, watch me on the daily shows, see me on CNBC, I cover pay yourself first always. You will not have financial freedom or achieve financial fulfillment or reach your financial dreams if you don't pay yourself first. So for those of you who've never heard me speak, I'm going to quickly go over what it means to pay yourself first. I'm going to add a few things that some of you have not heard me say. All right. So what does it mean to pay yourself first? That means when you earn money, the first person who gets paid, who is it? Who is it? If I was here, who gets paid first? Let me see. Let me see it in the comments. 
who gets paid first when you earn money? Point yourself and say, you, you get paid first. Me, me, yes, me, 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 me. Not the government. You don't pay taxes first. You pay yourself first. You don't pay the bank first. You pay yourself first. You don't pay credit cards first. You pay yourself first. You don't pay leases, mortgage, car payments, on and on and on. The first person who gets paid is you. It is, I've always taught it as a step. It hit me in the end of December. Like, it's a principle. It is a principle belief system. It's not a habit, by the way. Although I'm going to show you how it can be a habit. It is a principle. It is a core way of living your life. Hopefully, if you're doing it, this is the way you'll live your life forever. And if you're not, it's the way you'll live your life starting today. And it doesn't even matter. I'm going to tell you how much you should pay yourself first. But I will start by saying what matters is that you do it. So you need to pay yourself first a specific percentage of what you earn. Uh, and then the second thing is you need to do it automatically. The third, automatically, meaning that you're not going to budget because you don't have time to budget. You won't fall through with budgeting. It takes too long. It doesn't, you don't need to budget today. It's too simple today. Today with all the financial technology, all the financial service companies all over the world on an app, in minutes, you could be saving money automatically. And just literally, there's no limit to investing today. You can invest a dollar a day. It's so simple today to invest in a diversified portfolio of exchange traded mutual funds. You don't need to know what stock to buy. None of this is complicated. You could simply start with an index fund, but you've got to pay yourself first automatically. And the number I recommend has always been one hour a day of your income. Now that's for people who work and have jobs and they work from nine to five. One hour day of your income comes out to be 12 and a half percent of your gross income. What I would like to see all of you do, the strivers in this room, I want you to save 15% of your gross income off the top automatically from here on out for the rest of your life. That's your pay yourself first goal. Automatically for the rest of your life. And here's the fourth thing that I don't always say when it comes to pay yourself first. You got to pay yourself first automatically, one hour day of your income, and you need to not time the market. It is time in the market. What that means is the stock, because you, you need to invest in the stock market. Your money's got to be a combination of stocks and bonds and real estate. It needs to be diversified, but your money has to out earn inflation. Now, inflation has been a very minor issue for the previous 25 years. People have talked about inflation always being 2% roughly. It hasn't been a big deal. I've always said that that's a complete myth, that inflation actually is much higher than that. Inflation has been higher than that for decades because the things that matter, healthcare, education, and housing costs have skyrocketed. So when you hear that inflation has been low, and now they talk about inflation is the highest it's ever been, and I think in 50 years as of the end of the week, it's, it's sort of, it's, in some ways, it's a little bit, it's not that it's meaningless, but it's, it's not accurate. We've had inflation, all right? I, my 18-year-old my son's about to go to college, and the cost for him to go to the average college in America is somewhere between fifty dollars to $80,000 a year. It's so utterly insane what college costs today. When I went to college, college costs, I went to a private university. It was $6,000 a year. And it went up to the point by my time I was a senior, which was still, it wasn't like I was a senior for 10 years here, right? It doubled. It was $12,000 by the end of the year. That school is $80,000 now. So healthcare costs, you know, the things I'm talking about, you know, since I wrote the article in 2006, the cost of houses have basically gone up two times. So you've got to be invested paying yourself first in, you've got to have money in stock market. You have to have money in real estate because those are the asset classes that go up where you're on the escalator to building wealth. What you can't do, my friends, and I'm please hear me on this, is you can't time the market. When the markets go down and if you panic and you sell, you will, you will consistently wipe yourself out financially. If you sold in March of now we're going back two years when COVID hit, and the market went down 32% and you panicked in that month where the market dropped that much in nine days where a lot of people did, a lot of smart people did. And they're going to wait for the market to go back up and then invest. The market went back up and invested and completely recovered in 100 days. And then it doubled from there. You, you can't time the market. No one has been able to time the market. 
I am telling you, professional investors can't time the market. You know, I really look forward to being with you every month. And this is such an exciting one for me to do because I've had all month to think about what do I want to share when it comes to being calm. So here's what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to go through habits to help you be financially calm and financially productive. So as you all know, my expertise is personal finance. I like to help you get your finances right so you can live your best life. And I know that when you fix your financial habits, you fix your financial life. So here we go. Number one, it's gonna be the most annoying habit, spend less than you earn. Nothing will create anxiety in your life like consistently spending more money than you make, nothing. And it is the number one cause of, of anxiety, stress, and concern in people's lives. It is this constant treadmill of whatever you make, you spend more. Not just whatever you make, you spend, but whatever you make, you spend more. So the fastest way to have a calmer life is to spend less than you make. Now, let me just address, I know that this is not easy for everyone to do, uh, especially now because with inflation, everything is starting to cost more. But before we talk about all the reasons why this is difficult, let's talk about the ways in which you fix these things. First way you fix making sure you spend less than you make is making sure you actually know where you're spending your money. And what you really need to be looking at is what, what here's what happens in the real world. And I know I'm saying something I've said before on this one, but what happens in the real world is people, it's the weirdest phenomenon. People round up in their mind what they earn. If a person makes $76,780 a, a year and you ask that person, like Michelle Anderson, I said, to, she's, hi, Michelle. <laughs> if I said to Michelle, what do you make? Michelle, says, I make, Michelle would not typically say, I make $76,870 a year. That's not her number. I'm just throwing it out as an example. She would say, probably, not picking on you, Michelle, just using you as an example to keep you all awake here like a classroom. She'd say I make 80,000 a year. In her mind, she would round up the number. It's the most fascinating thing because everyone does this. We round up what our earnings are and we round down what our expenses are in our mind. And what happens often by rounding up what we earn in our mind and rounding down what we spend is there's a 10 to 20% differential. And that 10 to 20% differential is why people are constantly financially freaking out because the math doesn't work. And the other problem is that people focus on gross earnings numbers instead of net earning numbers. Gross numbers, no matter where you live, it's the same issue. It's gross numbers are what you earn before taxes. Across the board, across the world, most of you, if you make $100,000, most of you are paying, what, $30,000 in taxes? Some of you are paying $40,000 in taxes. So if you make $100, you are not making $100, you are making $60 or $65 or $70. And that's what you have to learn to live below is the net number. That's number one. Number two habit. So number one habit, spend less than you make. Number two habit. This one, my friends, is key. This is a habit that will build you financial freedom for life. And that habit is, this, especially for the young people listening, save half of your pay increases. Save half of your pay increases, bonuses, and tax refunds. Now, there's a reason why I'm telling you to save half. Most financial wannabe experts will tell you to save all of it. And nobody does. <laughs> There's no way you're going to save all of your pay increase or your tax refund or your bonus. Nobody does that. But if you think in your mind, I'm going to save half of it, and you start to save half of it for the rest of your life, you will never have to worry about money again for the rest of your life. It will change everything. The other thing is that right now, a lot of you who have jobs are getting pay increases. A lot of you are going to get pay increases by the end of the year going into next year. It will be the highest increase in salaries we've seen in, in decades. 
And that is because inflation is requiring businesses today to up what they pay people. And what is happening right now, and I find it fascinating because I, I own a couple of major businesses, is that local markets now are having to compete with global markets. And what I mean by that is, if you have a business, because I have some businesses in markets that the salaries, let's just say, could be significantly less than what they might be in Manhattan, Chicago, LA, or San Francisco, right? Because if you have a business in the Midwest, as example, the cost of living is much lower. It's why people move there. But now, because so many jobs are going virtual, people are moving to lower price markets and getting full pay. And what that's doing is requiring businesses now to retain their employees. They're having to give pay increases. So you're going to see pay increases head into next year. And I'm just here to tell you that what everybody's going to want you to do is go out and spend all that money. And what I want you to do is save half of it. Save half of the increase that you get, save half of your bonuses, save half of your tax refunds. You'll be in great financial shape. And that leads me to number three habit. The number three habit is to save money automatically. Hello, you've heard me say this a million times. Save money automatically. Do not budget. If you have not yet read The Automatic Millionaire, the new edition, go get your hands on The Automatic Millionaire. If you don't know how to save autom money automatically, this is your Bible. You can read this book in less than two hours and put your financial life on autopilot in less than 60 minutes. The way people build real wealth is through the habit of saving money automatically. I love it. I see you, Chris. Chris Flotten just pulled his book off his shelf. Bravo, my friend. You got the old edition, though. You need to get the new one. I know you got the old edition, too, because it's a hardcover. I love that. Which takes me to lesson number four. When you read the Automatic Millionaire book, or you read any of my books, for that matter, but the Automatic Millionaire specifically, you learn about this concept of paying yourself first. In order for you to build real wealth, wherever you live around the world, you have to make a decision to pay yourself first. That means when you earn money, and, they, and this is the gross dollars, when you earn those gross dollars, when you earn a dollar, the first person who gets paid is you. By paying yourself first, you then don't pay taxes on that money because you'll get a tax deduction. And you want to be saving at minimum one hour a day of your gross income. And that's a 12.5% number. And the number to write down to keep the math simple, your goal should be to be saving 15% of your gross income. You save 15% of your gross income from now until the rest of your life, and you'll never have financial issues. And one of the ways you can get to that 15% number is by taking the half of the pay increase that you'll get. And before you know it, you've just found the money to do the 15%. And that takes me to, fit, to uh, habit here number five. Habit number five is I want you to focus on ROC. Make that capital letters. Focus on ROC. This is habit number five. What is ROC? It is not rock, baby. It is return of capital. Now, if my buddy Brandon is listening, you know, he's laughing because I sent him a text about this issue once because a lot of my friends come to me with investment questions and investment ideas. And the wealthier that people get, the more complicated the investment ideas become. And often those investment ideas are not liquid. And what they lead to is loss often of all your money. Now, nobody who invests with a goal of losing all their money. People invest with a goal of getting a rate of return on their money, ROI, rate of return. ROI stands for rate of return. A lot of times with investments, you'll hear about ROI or you'll hear about IRR, internal, internal rate of return, or you'll hear about cap rates. That's the capitalization rate, which again is about a rate of return. The number one thing I care about when I invest is can I get my money back? It's not what's the rate of return on my money. It's my putting my money somewhere that I can get it back. Because there's nothing more depressing than taking your hard-earned dollars that you've worked so hard to save with these first four rules, and then it all goes away. So I just need you to be always thinking when you make an investment, is, is am I going to be able to get my money back? When you are wrong, Admit it. Now, this is a very interesting life lesson for me to start with. 
the reason I'm starting with it is that it, this life lesson is what actually sent me down the journey of personal development. So little story here, when I was 20 years old, I went to the University of Hawaii for summer school. And I was thinking about this today. I went to the University of Hawaii for summer school and I took two classes, oceanography and astronomy. There were classes that I needed to make up for USC because I had taken a semester and gone and worked on a presidential campaign for a congressman in Washington, DC. So I had to make up these general education classes. So I was not always the most studi studious student and I wanted to know what were the easy classes to take at the University of Hawaii. And I was told that one of the easiest classes was oceanography. And I was given bad advice. That was not an easy class. So as the class is going through the course, it starts to occur to me that I'm on track to get a D in this class. And I can't afford to go back to USC with a D on my transcript. So I call my parents and I let them know I'm going to have to drop this class so that this grade doesn't transfer back to USC. I'm gonna be fine in astronomy, but oceanography, I gotta drop it. And my parents were not pleased with this. So on the way to the beach, after breaking the news to my parents, I'm really depressed and I go into a bookstore and I go to the personal development self-help section. Cause I think to myself, I need to find, I need to learn something this summer. And I see a book that is Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I've talked about this book once before at some point over the year. And I pull the book off the shelf and I go to the beach with my friends and my friends, and I'm sitting on the beach reading this book and my friends start coming over and they're laughing at me. Like, why are you reading Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People? Like you need that book. And I, and I sort of share the story and I keep reading the book. And a couple hours later, I get, put the book in my backpack and I go to work and my job, I'm a pedicab driver. So when I'm not going to school, I'm pedicabbing. So for those who don't know what a pedicab is, it's the bicycle that you ride and you pick up people and you give them rides. And I do this in Waikiki Beach. And right as I've gotten onto my pedicab with my little Dale Carnegie book in my backpack, I get pulled over by a police officer. And the police officers in Waikiki Beach hated us pedicab drivers because most of us were college kids that had come over for the summer and they felt like the pedicabs just created uh, traffic and they felt like they were a nuisance. And so they love to give us tickets and they're expensive tickets and they go on your driver's license and they create points and you can get your pedicab driver's license pulled. And so you just don't wanna get pulled over. And when you get pulled over, it's a guaranteed ticket. And sometimes they just pull your license from you. So I'm, my heart is pounding and I've been pulled over and it's a car with sirens and lights and everything. And my, my other friends are driving by me in their pedicabs and kind of laughing. They're like looking at me like, ha, what'd you do? And the officers comes over and I do exactly what was in the Dale Carnegie book, which was admit my mistake and apologize. So when you were wrong, admit it. And I proceed to do what the book taught me to do, which is, own my mistake, feel my mistake, and let the officer know how, how sorry I am. So I say to the officer, and the other thing I learned in the book was to always use people's names. Is it okay if I use your name, sir? And he says, yes. And I use his name, his name, I'll just say it was Bob. I said, Bob Smith, you know, sir, I'm so sorry. There's no excuse. I was not paying attention. I did not, I, I just wasn't paying attention. It wasn't that I didn't see, see the stop sign. I, I do this all day long, uh, every night here. I just wasn't paying attention. And thank you for pulling me over because I could have hurt somebody. There's all these tourists going up and down the street. They're not paying attention. And the last thing they need to do is be hit by me in a pedicab. I could have sent somebody to the hospital. And I am just owning my mistake and I'm ripping on myself. Like I am such an idiot. I can't believe I did this. Thank you for pulling me over. I deserve to have the book thrown at me. Whatever you need to do, I completely understand. So the guy takes my driver's license. He goes back to the car and does whatever they do with those driver's license and checks about who I am and comes back to me and he hands me the driver's license and he says, Mr. Bach, today is your lucky day. I am not going to ticket you. I am going to let you go, but please pay more attention from now on. And by the way, you don't need to be so hard on yourself. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs>
Okay, so he leaves and I go out with my friends and they've all seen me because all my buddies pedic are pedicabbing and they're like, how bad was the ticket? What did you get? I'm like, you guys aren't going to believe this. He let me go. And they're like, there's no way. They never let anybody go. And they're like, how? And I'm like, I just totally admitted my mistake. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I got this book. I pull it out of my backpack and I'm like, it talks about it. So I just start telling them the story. And they're like, I can, you're, you're lying. It couldn't possibly work. Well, it did work. And that was the moment in my life where I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff does work. Sometimes you get an idea in a book and one idea can change your life. And so I devoured that book. And then I would go on to devour so many books on personal development. And I still devour books and I'm still here here with you devouring more content on personal development and I'm teaching it. And I've been doing this now since I was 20 and I just turned 55, had my birthday last week. So I, um, that's my journey and how I got started. And that's only one lesson, but that lesson is number one, when you were wrong, admit it. I'm going to give you a behind the scenes look at what top financial advisors do for their clients. Now, if you're watching this and you don't have a financial advisor, that's okay, because if you don't have a financial advisor, these will be the 18 things that you should be doing for yourself. If you do have a financial advisor, by me going through these 18 things, you may go, huh, my advisor is not currently doing that. And that's okay, because you could coach them on, these are the things I wanna review with you before the end of the year. Or it may be one of those things where you start to go, maybe it's time for me to hire a new financial advisor, which by the way, the end of the year is a perfect time to be making that decision. Let's go. Are you ready? Take out the pen and pad of paper and let's start writing these things down or in your app, put the notes down. So the number one thing that a top advisor is going to do for you, and remember, if you don't have a financial advisor, then this is what you should be doing for yourself. Number one thing is they're going to check in with you and schedule a year-end review meeting. This is so obvious. And again, I train financial advisors all year long, but there are so many advisors who don't consistently meet with their clients at the end of the year or the beginning of the year. The end of the year, I personally believe, like if I were in front of hundreds of my advisors right now, I'd be saying the end of the year is the time you meet with your clients. The reason is there's a lot of tax planning that goes into the end of the year. Like one of the most important things at the end of the year is have you fully maximized your retirement accounts? So I'll talk about here in a second. It's important to meet at the end of the year to review these things so you know if you have. So the number one thing is, have you got a year in review meeting scheduled with your financial advisor? If you don't, you should get one set up. I would be calling your financial advisor and setting one up right now. I would get into their office before December 15th. By the way, I told you there's 64 days left in the year. Just for fun and giggles, guess how many days there's left between now and Thanksgiving, wait, I wrote this down somewhere. Where is it? There's 20 work days between now and Thanksgiving. It's a very important number to know, by the way, because many people really stop work, working after Thanksgiving. Between Thanksgiving and Christmas, a lot of people don't do work. When you own a company, that doesn't work. You've got to make sure people work all the way through the end of the year. Another topic. But back to number two of the 18 things I wanted to give you. Number two is this. The question a top financial advisor is going to ask you is the following. Has anything changed financially in your life of significance this year? Why is that question so important? Because things change all the time. Things can change on the expense side. Like, oh yeah, things change. You know what? The refrigerator broke. Then the dishwasher broke. And now the car's got 100,000 miles on it and I need a new car. Or my kid went to college, but then came home and is now living with us. Um, the roof needs to be fixed. I happen to be staying in a place right here on the beach and there's two properties right next to me where the roofs are being redone, right? All kinds of things happen that change your life financially. You might've lost your job business could be down. The opposite could be true too. You may have sold an investment where you made a bunch of money. Business could be up a lot. It is critical to get to the end of the year and ask yourself the question, has anything major changed? It's critical for your financial advisor to ask that question, which takes me to number three. A financial advisor, I think if they're smart and good at what they do, they're going to ask you this question. Have you looked at your accounts lately? 
do you have any questions? First of all, I asked this question as a financial advisor. I spent nine years at Morgan Stanley. I learned by asking this question, which of my clients actually look at their statements and which don't. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to be looking at your broker statements or looking at your accounts online every single day, but it's good for an advisor to know if you're paying any attention at all. And it's really important to know if you've got questions about what you currently own. What, what you find when you ask this question as a financial advisor is that many clients don't look at their statements and a shockingly large percentage of clients have absolutely no clue how to read their statements. Uh, one of the most complicated things that the financial service industry does is create poorly done statements that are confusing to the average client. So if you print those statements, what you should do with your financial advisor is be sitting down with them and making sure you understand what you're seeing on paper or what you see on your screen. And if you don't have a financial advisor, it's still really important. Which takes me to, in the same category, let's review your plan. So I'm hoping at this point, if you have a financial advisor, you actually have a real financial plan at which point they're gonna pull out the financial plan and review it with you. Because at the end, I'm gonna talk about discussing with your advisor whether or not you're on track with your plan, ahead of plan, or behind plan. And that takes me to question number four. Let's review the performance of the accounts. Now, a lot of advisors will just wanna wait till the end of the year to review the performance because it's easier to do year to date, year over year performance. However, it's also fine to do year to date performance. It's YTD, year to date performance. It's really helpful to look at your accounts right now. We're at the end of October and do year to date performance. You can also go back very easily with all the computer systems and look at the previous 12 months, previous three years, previous five years. That is something that you should be doing. And the reason is, and this was number four, is that once you review the performance, you want to review the performance against your goals, your financial goals, and you want to review the performance against the indexes that the mark that the portfolio was created to go against. It's called a benchmark. So traditionally, when a financial advisor meets with you and puts together a portfolio, they're going to put together a portfolio that's hopefully it's diversified of stocks and bonds and cash and global investments. And they're going to tell you the benchmark that they are putting this portfolio together to measure it against. And then what they should be doing is showing you, hey, we chose this benchmark to measure against. Here's how we're doing compared to the benchmarks. Because that's what's going to help them also when it comes time to do tax loss harvesting, help you do that which takes me to number five. A top financial advisor is going to re-review with you your risk tolerance. So in most cases, if you have a top financial advisor, how the portfolio got built was not just based off your financial goals, it was also based off your risk tolerance. How much comfort do you have taking risk? And they probably walked you through a risk profile questionnaire. And that questionnaire then helped create the degree of how much money went in stocks versus how much money went in bonds or whatever the money was invested in. It was based off your risk tolerance. Why is it critical to review your risk tolerance at the end of the year? Because again, things change in people's lives. And so how you feel right now may be different than how you felt a year ago. Also, as you get older, your risk tolerance typically will change because you'll want to take less risk with your money as you're getting older. So that is important to do. And what happens on a year like this year and last year is that the market's gone up so much. Stock market's having just, again, a phenomenal year. Like the market itself, depending on which benchmark you're looking at, it's like up 17% for the year. Some benchmarks are up 20% for the year. So, you know, if you've had a boring diversified portfolio, you should be up, again, 10% at this point. If you've been in, you know, more aggressive investments like Bitcoin, you're up over 100% for the year. So it all depends on what you're invested in. But what happens when you're invested, and I'm getting super detailed here with you because that's what I wanted to do. When you're invested and your assets start to go up, 
the risk of your portfolio goes up because you end up having more and more of these riskier assets as they grow. And so part of a financial advisor's job is to point out, hey, we started as an example with a portfolio that was, let's say, 60% stock and 40% fixed income bonds. But now because the market's gone up so much, you're actually at 68% stock and you're at 32% bonds. So part of their job at the end of the year is to discuss with you the need to rebalance the portfolio to reduce the risk. Unless you as the client say, no, 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 you know what? I want to keep my gas on the pedal because it's going so well. I don't want to reduce my risk. The problem with that approach, my friends, is you don't want to keep your foot on the gas forever. We have just had, I mean, the the last 10 years of the stock market, people are, oh, you can't make 10% of the stock market. If you've been in now in an index fund for the last 10 years, you've had an annualized return over 15%. So people's portfolios are way riskier than they should be if they haven't rebalanced, which again, if you have an advisor, they should be doing this for you. If you're your advisor, you need to be doing this for you. What's a formula for building resilience in your life? I came up with what I think are the three, at least for me, have been three key anchors, if you will, pillars to build resilience in my life. And so that's what I want to start with right now. And this is personal resilience. So the first thing is, number one, you have to recognize your resilience. I sat down, I really started like thinking about my resilience and, and, and particularly what I'm, I'm just dealing with right now is, is in my own case, it's the resilience of the of my health issue. It's the resilience of the pain that I'm in right now. And it's super easy for me, and I know for you when things are going wrong, to go into a, you know, my wife calls it a, a, a rabbit hole, right? Like you go into a hole of, of worry. And so for me, like my worry is like, this surgery is not, not gonna work. And if these stem cells that were implanted in my ankle don't work and my pain doesn't get reduced, there's just so much I can't do. And so then what's next? And I can go down a whole worry wall, almost like a wall of worry. And yet what I know is the fastest way to get out of worry is to work, work on what can be done, work on what can be changed. I made a list of some of the most difficult things I've ever gone through in my life, personally, professionally, physically. We forget what we've done in the past when we overcame things. So writing it all out for me was a reminder of like, yeah, 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 I can do this. I, I, I'm, I'm right. I'm, I'm, I'm tough. I have courage. I have strength. So do you. The, the theme of this last book I wrote, The Latte Factor, it's funny. I, I've talked about this before. People think that this book was all about, um, some, if you haven't read it, people think, oh, it's about giving up your coffee. And no, it's not. Um, the theme of the book was for Zoe Daniels, the character, and all of us who read it, is that you are stronger than you think, you have more courage than you know, your dreams deserve to become real. That's the core message. What I wanna encourage you to do this month in your journal is I wanna encourage you to write out and record your resilience. Make a list of what you've gone through this difficult. Now, somebody might think like, well, isn't this negative? Isn't it? Is it a negative thing to, to go back and remind yourself of what's difficult? And I, I don't think it is. I think it's actually a very positive thing because you can confront and remind yourself, hey, I did this. And guess what? I'm still standing. I'm still here. I've gotten through it. I've learned these lessons. I'm stronger from it. And, and, and that is a huge, huge part of building your resilience muscles. The second thing is that it's really important not just to record and recognize your resilience, it's really important to reward your resilience. If I go back and I look at this week I just spent at Four Seasons Hawaii with my family, taking my parents away for their birthday, that was a fantastic example of re rewarding my resilience because the power was during that week, that was an extremely extravagant trip, but I could sit there and go like, man, all this hard work that I've done, this was a reward. 
Now that was a reward in spirit with my family. It's also a reward for myself. It doesn't have to be a big trip to reward yourself. There are lots of ways to reward yourself. You might have a big victory and the reward is you take your family out and you have dinner and you have, instead of a birthday cake, you have like a resilience cake. And you know, you're like, here's what I've overcome. I mean, honestly, even doing this like with your kids would be super powerful. Cause like, if you've got children, letting your children know, like, you know, mom, mom, mom went through this or dad went through this, or we went through that, but we made it out the other end. And today we're going to have a resilience party. Come up with a way to reward yourself. Because when you reward your resilience, you remind yourself again that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So much of life and success and happiness and wealth and health is getting back up again after you've been knocked down. Getting up over and over and over again. Not quitting. And that takes me to the third thing which is rewire your resilience. So let me give you an example in my own life of how I literally just am doing this right now. And I'm just, and the reason I share these, my own life examples um, is for, for a teaching lesson, but I'm going through it too. So, you know, I had surgery in Utah in Park City. My original plan had been to go live in Italy for a year and then move to Park City. Because my plan had been that I was going to spend the next 10 years of my life doing a whole lot of skiing. And that plan has been adjusted right now because I can barely walk, much less ski. So I went and looked at real estate, though, when I was in Park City again. And I went, to, there's a picture of me on Instagram where I'm on the bottom of the mountain at Deer Valley. And it's a picture of me smiling and I'm all happy. And I am happy. But I had a moment also at the bottom of the ski mountain where I had just looked at a piece of property and I had this super deep, sad ache in my heart where I literally was like, I can't buy a house here until I know I can ski. Because the thought of having a house at the bottom of Deer Valley and not being able to ski is something I just won't be able to do. And I actually went back to the realtor and told her, you know what? I got to wait six months and I need to see how I can feel because it'll be too hard for me emotionally to have a ski house and not be able to ski. Then I had a couple of days in, in Utah where I wasn't feeling well, where I was in huge pain and I was bummed. And what I did to rewire this, so I here, because again, I'm using myself as an example. What I was doing that was bumming me out is I was making a list of all the things I can no longer do in my mind. I can't ski. I can't hike. I can't go for long walks with my wife. By the way, making a list of negative things in your mind is not helpful, right? I'm going through this list in my mind and then I go, you know what? What could you be do? What could you do, David? I end up watching a movie about a woman who is paralyzed. Nicole Kidman's the star of the movie. And so she's paralyzed, she's depressed, she's feeling sorry for herself. And I don't want to give the whole movie away, but she takes up um, kayaking. And the movie is based on a true story. At the end of the, at the, end of the movie, you get to see a picture of the, of the real woman it's based on. And I'm watching this movie and I'm like, I also know that I don't have, that the people have more, there are people have more problems than myself, but it doesn't matter, right? If, if you throw a pity party for yourself, the pity party is real. So back to re rewiring your resilience, I turned around and made a list in my journal what could be all the new things that I could take up that I don't do that wouldn't require me to have a, a great ankle? What else could I be doing? Oh, I could take up kayaking. Oh, I could take up swimming. And I started making the list of all the things that I could do. And then I also made a list of all the things I still can do. That's how you rewire yourself for resilience. So good to be with everyone here. Wow. What I want to do today is share with you a tool that I learned about 15 years ago that really changed my life, that allowed me to focus much better than I used to focus. 
And even though, you know, I'm known as the financial person on this, on growth day, I really, to me, the money is just a tool to help free you live your best life. I'm going to give you a tool today that you can use for money, but you can use it for your health. You can use it for your marriage. You can use it for being a parent. It looks simple, but it's complicated and hard to actually put in place. So I'm going to give you a couple of quotes right now, and you can just write these quotes out. So number one is control your time or someone else will. The one thing in life that we actually can't get back is our time. You can lose money and you can make it again. You can lose friendships and you can get them back. The one thing you can't get back is your time. And I'm going to encourage you to learn how to put a wall around yourself and other people's request of your time if it's not truly what you want to focus on. So that's number one. Number two, deciding what not to do is often more important than what to do. People have recurring thoughts, everyone, all human beings. Number one is, am I going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? We're always asking ourselves, am I going to be okay? It's literally wired into a 2.3 million year old brain of ours. Then once we get past the point sometimes of, am I going to be okay? The next question we're all running around with is, what am I going to do with my life? What happens so often when we have so many things on our plate, we say, well, I don't know what I want to do. And what I can tell you is when you start to strip away other people requesting your time and, and you don't have a long to-do list, you will start to be able to listen to your soul and figure out what it is you're supposed to do with your life. Which takes me to number three. Focusing is hard, scary, and confusing. And I can also tell you, it gets easier with time and it creates a beautiful life. That's the benefit, which takes me to number four. No is a complete sentence. And that takes me to number five, which is this idea that doing less allows you to live more. Let me go into, with this, this story that changed my life. So what, what happened about a little over 15 years ago is that I was working on a big corporate partnership. And this was a financial service company that I was super excited to partner with. We prospect them. They reach back out to us. It's going to be this big, giant deal. And I come into my office and my assistant says to me and my team, I have some very bad news. You're going to want to sit down for this. And I go, what? And they're like, well, you're going to need to read the email. And I get this email from the founder of the company. And the email says, David, we were so excited to work on this partnership with you. I was really looking forward to being in business with you. But I'm really, unfortunately, sorry to say that it's not you. It's us. And we, unfortunately, are not going to be able to go forward on this partnership now. We're not saying, these are lines, my friends, that you can use yourself in so many ways. We are not saying no. We're saying not now. I hope we can continue the relationship maybe later. So fast forward about a year and a half, two years later, and I see that his business has been sold. And it's sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. And so I send him an email and I'm like, wow, you know, congratulations. Like, you know, you, you did it. And I'm so happy for you. And he immediately replies to me and he says, um, oh my gosh, David, it's so good to hear back from you. I'm so sorry we didn't go into business together. You know, one of the reasons we didn't go business together is I was working on this whole thing to just pull off what we just did. And, you know, he, he's like, but I'm coming through New York and I'd love to take you out for that cup of coffee. And uh, he takes me to coffee and we have a beautiful breakfast together at a restaurant called Bubby's. And we go back to my office in Tribeca. And, I've, and in my office, I had two giant whiteboards. On the left whiteboard was the year's goals. So that the whole company could come into my office and we'd have meetings and we'd look at, the, look at this whiteboard. Here's what we're focused on for the year. And that whiteboard was completely filled. Then I had a second whiteboard of all the to-dos that we were working on. And that whiteboard was completely filled. So back to the story, call, calling him M, he comes into my office and, he, and he, he says, you know, you asked me a question, what did you do differently that your competitors didn't do? 
And he said, we focused. He goes, want me, want me to show you how he did it? <laughs> yeah, I would love to. He goes, okay. He turned and he turns around in the office and he goes, can I erase your whiteboards? And the racers are sitting on the bottom of the whiteboard. And I go, yeah, sure. Well, first I go, uh, and I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> right, someone's just made over $100 million. Yeah, you can erase my whiteboards. So we get the whiteboards totally clean. And he says, okay, I had, he goes, and this is what he told me. He goes, I, ha I can't, he goes, I can't believe this, but this is the truth. He goes, I had an office like yours. I had a whole wall. The whole wall was our whiteboard. And we had all these goals on our whiteboard. And he said, one day there was a realization in the company that if we were going to survive, we had to focus because we were just scattered. And the board was putting heat on us to focus. And so we took it and we had a week long retreat and we made a decision that we would focus in on one thing. And we would take our whiteboard, completely erase it and put one thing on that whiteboard that we would focus on. He's like, what we literally did was put one thing on the left-hand side. We drew a line down the wall. We called that our yes now. It actually was like our number one to do. He called it the number one to do. And he's like, and then we had a not to do list, which I now call the not now list. And he's like, everything that we were working on and you, David, were one of those things. Instead of just throwing it away, it literally got put on the not now list. And the entire company got restructured to focus on the one thing. And I'm like, well, how, how did that go over? And he's like, it was super hard because people are used to working on so many things and everything had to be revamped around one thing. He goes, well, what happened is over time, he's like, well, people would come into my office because if you run a company, this happens. Everyone comes in your office and by the way, if you're a parent, the kids come in your room, right? There's always somebody coming in and wanting something from you. And he's like, when people would come in, they if I would if they were asking me to do something, work on something, want my feedback on something, I would ask the question immediately: Is this related to our one thing that we're focused on? Because if it's not, then you can't even bring it to me. You you can go put it over on the not now list. And the not now list had stickies, right? So like you can take it and put it on the not now. This was his thing. He'd make a sticky and he'd put it and you can sign it. And we might look at it later, but we're not looking at it now. Remember, we made this commitment for the next year that we're focused on this one thing. And ultimately, because he focused on this one thing and that one thing worked, and basically they tripled down and quadrupled down on what was working best. That's what allowed him to sell the company for hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Well-being is personal to each and every one of you, and it's different. And the truth about well-being is that what's important to me for well-being, what's important to Brendan for well-being, what's important to Michelle, who I can see, and Sophie, and Vicky, and Venus, and Maria, and Ginger, and Ray, and Sheila, and Francesca, every one of you have a different definition of well-being is, or actually you don't even have a definition. So you need to come up with what is the, your definition of well-being right now, at this moment in time, because I promise you 10 years ago, the definition of well-being was different for you. Some of you, the definition of well-being pre-COVID was different. What is your personal definition of well-being? Once you've done that is I want you to rate your current well-being on a scale of one to 10. So one being the lowest, 10 being the highest, where are you today, right now? My wife taught me when I first started dating her that you can start your day over. Write that down. You can start your day over. Important thing about well-being because you can, if something goes wrong and you're having a bad day, you can start your day over. I'll never forget my, when, back when my wife was my girlfriend, I'm talking to her at work and she's like, how you doing? I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm having the worst day. And I start telling her why. And she goes, did you know you can start your day over? And I go, what are you talking about? She's like, you can just decide to start your day over. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, like just decide. Like, I'm like, honey, it's two o'clock. He's like, yep, you can start the whole day over. Oh, it's, it's good to know. You can start your whole day over. Just knowing that can increase your well-being. You can start your week over. You can start your year over, my friends.
Some of you had this huge list of stuff you had all planned for the year and you're like, oh, I haven't even, I had this huge list and I haven't even got to it. It's okay. You can start your year over. You can actually start your life over by choosing to start your life over. I want you to title today's talk, for me at least, as recharge time. Recharge time. And you're going to understand why it's recharge time. Because to me, well-being is all about the level in which you charge yourself up. And how many of you have one of these? These things called a phone, right? And here's the funny thing about the phone. If you, without you looking at your phone right now, you have a pretty good sense of whether or not your phone is fully charged, partially charged, or needs to be charged. Unfortunately, we don't have a charging monitor on ourselves to tell us, are we fully charged? Are we half charged? Are we almost completely depleted? And I know what it's like personally to run myself out of my battery completely. And you know what happens with phones? If you've had a phone for a while, there comes a point in time where you plug it in and it doesn't hold its battery as long. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right? Because when you get a new phone and the battery is fresh, you charge it up, battery stays, char stays charged. After you've had that phone for years, and I think part of this is rigged for us to buy new phones, before you know it, the battery can't be recharged fully happens to a lot of people, they stop being recharged and they get depleted. And then sometimes you need to actually replace your batteries. So I'm gonna go through recharge time today and I'm gonna start by giving you number one, what you need to do. You need to take a fearless inventory, a fearless inventory of what you want in life and what you don't want in life. One of the fastest ways to improve your well-being is to get rid of the things in life that you don't want and to do more of what you do want. And man, does that sound simple, but it's not easy because you have to really start to think and you need to spend time on this, like taking out that journal, like what is it in your life that you don't want right now? What is it in your life that's not working for you? Who's in your life that's not working for you? Who's in your life that is working for you? You need more of what works and less of what doesn't work. That's number one, taking a fearless, fearless inventory. Number two is you need to recognize that you need recharge time. You need to recognize that just like your phone, you have to become selfish and make sure that you are recharging yourself. And you have to get clear around what is recharging yourself look like. Again, it's totally personal to each and every one of you. What, 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 what are the activities that you do that fill you back up again? What do you do on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, a yearly basis? When you look at those people that have success and happiness and well-being, what you find is they all, first of all, have a daily practice. So that takes me to number three which is committing to recharge daily. Why did morning rituals become such a popular thing? I think it's because they work. <laughs> I mean, honestly, when you look at people who are highly successful and happy and have well-being, they tend to have morning rituals. I never knew I had morning rituals until I started hearing about all these people who had morning rituals. And I'm like, oh my God, those are all the things that I do. My morning rituals are incredibly clear. Here's how I recharge daily. I'm going to go through just telling you what I do daily. The first thing I do in the morning is I meditate. I heard about meditation for 20 years before I did it. I heard Deepak Chopra talk about meditation three times personally. Third time I heard him talk about it. Yeah, it always made sense until I actually did it. So every morning I wake up and I meditate. Second thing I do is I take out my gratitude journal and I write out my gratitude for the day. I write out the three things I'm grateful for from yesterday. And I write down the three things I'm excited about for today. And then I write down the number one thing I'm going to do for the day that matters the most. It takes me about three to four minutes to do that in a journal. Then I exercise almost every single day. I exercise in the morning. Now I do that after I take, usually either it's before I get the kids ready for school or it's right after I get the kids off to school. And I also connect with my children every morning. That's my goal. 
every morning, you know, my, when I grew up, my father was off to work before I went to school and he often came home after I went to bed. And so I made it a priority that in the morning, I'm going to be, I'm going to be up with my kids. I'm going to have breakfast with my kids. I'm going to take my 11 year old down to a, put him on his bus. And then I'm going to, right now I'm driving the teenager to school because he wants a ride and I can't believe I get the extra 15 minutes with him. And so I take the teenager to school and then I come back and work out. And then the other part of my day is that I have clear priorities. So again, my, what does it mean to have clear priorities? My day is scheduled before the day starts. I know what my number one goal is for work. I know what my number one goal is personally, personally meaning selfishly for myself. And I know what my number one girl, my number one goal is for family and friends. And I'll go through in a second why I have those categories, but they're specific. And I know like today, my personal thing that I did for myself was I had a massage today for about 75 minutes. So I was like, woo, I know. Like, and by the way, now I have massages twice a week. It's part of my personal practice to it increases my well-being. Right? Today was a friend day. So today I had lunch with friends for two hours. And I have two days a week where I have friend day lunches. I have two days a week where I have wife lunches. So these things are scheduled into my week because I know when I do these things, my well-being is higher. Does this make sense? This takes me to number four. The way I find more time in my life, you guys, is that I commit to unplug. So these phones that I was telling you about, this one right here, remember the movie Star Wars and the Death Machine? This is the Death Machine, I think, these phones, of well-being. One of the fa one of the fastest ways to reduce your well-being is to spend an enormous amount of time on these phones. And so the fastest way to recognize how bad this issue is for you is to make is to be going into these phones and looking at how much time you spend on these phones a day. And Apple's got a little app in your phone if you don't use it and it will tell you and it will show you every week whether that usage is going up and down. And, and I used to spend way too much time on these phones. And so one of the things I learned from another person who was coaching me was the fastest way to start my day off wrong was to look at my phone in the morning. And why did I look at my phone in the morning? Because the phone was by my bed. I have charged my phone by my bed my entire life until last October. So starting last October, I made the decision to move the phone out of my bedroom. It stays in a different room and I have an old fashioned alarm clock and I don't get on my phone now. I picked a time. I recommend you pick a time. I don't get on my phone until 10 o'clock. So from the moment I get up, all the things that I do, I don't use I me. Mean, now I may use my phone for Google maps but I am not going through social media. I am not going through text. I'm not going through WhatsApp and I'm not going through email until 10 o'clock because I've carved out that time for me because I have figured out in my life that my well-being is higher if I focus my day on myself in the morning without all the distractions that a phone creates. This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember and you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.